In this unit, we will examine what it means to speak English in a business context across cultures and countries. We will bring up a few points about styles of business English and the pitfalls of multicultural communication. Let's dive in. Well, you might think they should speak Mandarin by now. But of course, English had a head start. In addition to a global addiction to weak tea, the British spread their language across their empire far and wide. There is Indian English, Nigerian English, and Australian English, all varieties of native languages. In addition, as the Harvard Business Review points out, 1.75 billion people worldwide speak English at the youthful level. Still, there are almost 1.4 billion Chinese, so perhaps the next world language will be Mandarin. There are several reasons why English is deemed desirable in an increasing number of corporations. There's certainly competitive pressure. If your competitors, head employees, communicate better in English than your staff do, well, that's some serious pressure. Have you ever worked with staff members and outsourced personnel across continents and time zones? I have. In a project I remember well, the graphics design staff were in Poland while we resided in California. When I sent off comments and instructions before I went home, it was done and completed by the time I showed up at work the next morning. Globalization is a fact. A friend of mine worked in a local data analysis company that was acquired by a larger German corporation. All of a sudden, a German woman was his boss. His German was pretty pitiful, so English it was. Luckily for this story, her English was superb. There is, of course, a danger in requiring employees whose native language is not English to become semi-fluent. One question is what fluency means. How do you measure this? Another major issue is employee resistance. It takes a lifetime to really learn a foreign language, and that is with all the help and time you could possibly need. Foreign language fluency has a lot to do with age. The younger, the better. How does that affect older and more seasoned staff members? It's quite a bit of a problem. Let's move on to some well-known issues in international English as a foreign language. American business language is peppered with idioms, many of them from pretty unique American sports such as football, and I don't mean soccer, and baseball. For example, you may know that a touchdown means scoring a goal in American football, but you shouldn't assume that your colleague in the Philippines does. However, she or he probably knows very well what it is to touch base, means what touch base means, since the Philippines is a great baseball nation. I wouldn't count on that, though. Try to avoid the most common idiomatic expressions from sports unless your colleague is just as fanatical as you are. Well, we also use a lot of cliches or expressions that are so overused as to become nearly meaningless. Think outside the box is one such. Blue sky thinking is another. Oh, uh, well, let's um, pick the low hanging, hanging fruit and go on to some common acronyms in business. Are we on the same page here? On this screen, you see a few common acronyms used daily in English speaking business. An acronym is when you use only the first letters of a phrase or a name to signify something, just as MS is an acronym for Microsoft. The ones on the screen mean, one by one, USP, unique selling proposition, SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, HR is human resources, ASAP means as soon as possible, BTW is by the way, and CRM is Customer Relationship Management. Oh boy. While we're on the subject of writing English that's understandable by all, I would like to mention two things. The first is that English sentences must have a subject and a verb with a tense. 
an object is not required. In many other languages, you don't need to include the subject if it has already been mentioned or it's understood. In English, a subject is obligatory. For example, it's wrong to write, I would appreciate your comments on this, always very useful. In English, you need to include the subject of the second sentence and say, I would appreciate your comments on this, they are always very useful. Secondly, try to avoid what I call Yoda speak and put the subject before the verb, such as happy we are to receive your comments should be we are happy to receive your comments. We'll have much more to say about this in the unit about grammar and punctuation. As you work your way through the videos and articles in this unit and read the chapter in our textbook, keep in mind that it's only communication if it communicates. Lack of communication can make you lose business or at least get a lot of confused messages. Your letters and messages are not drafts. They're the final product. I'm going to enjoy reading your essays about international business in this unit. See you soon.